It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, wild weather. Extreme heat coast to coast, while severe storms continue to slam parts of the country. We're live with the latest, including Dylan's full forecast. Then, fit for a king, King Charles in Scotland for a second coronation this morning. A look at today's ceremony, including who'll be there and who won't. Plus, how to save a life. Dr. John is here with some life-saving demonstrations for everyday medical emergencies. What you can do to step up and help before the experts arrive. And think twice. Global sensation twice. Joining us live, the K-pop group set to rock the plaza and their hordes of fans can't wait. Today, Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. Travel from Jerome, Arizona, Springfield, Virginia, Forest Park, Illinois, and Alhambra, California. We're back coming up on 814 now with your health and this morning some important life-saving skills that you can use during some of the most common emergency situations. Because when an emergency strikes, we know every second counts. So senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres is here to go over the simple ways we can all step in and save a life. Good morning. Good to morning, you. Dr. John. So let's do this first one here. This is actually a nightmare for me for a lot of us, right? You're at a restaurant, you're out to eat, um, maybe you're at home and someone starts choking. And at first you kind of watch to see if they yeah. can make it happen. And then you realize, no, this is a problem. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. And the first thing you want to do is realize that they're choking and be able to do something about it. So they say the inner national sign for choking is people holding their hand up here. In a panic situation, they might not do that. Yeah. It might be one, they might be pointing, might be clearing the table of things and just kind of writhing around. First thing you want to do is you want to go up to them and you want to say, are you choking? Mm -hmm. And they should be with it enough to go, yes, yes, and then let them know you're going to do something. Okay. Say, I know how to remove this. I'm going to help you just to make sure that they're okay with you helping them. They don't okay. think you're trying to assault Hurt them or them. something. Right. And then what you want to do is you want to stand behind them. This is choking Charlie. He's going to help us here. Choking Charlie. Yeah, choking Charlie. choking Charlie. He's definitely choking. So you want to stand Stand behind them. You want to go ahead and bend them over a little bit, right where their belly button is. You want to put your fist just a little above their belly button, one fist. Yes. Wrap your hand around that. Make sure they're in tight to you, and then you want to push in and up. Can That's I tell important. you why I said this was uh, scary for me and a lot of people? I'm afraid we're afraid we're going to hurt someone. You know what? You're not going to hurt them. Number one, you're in a soft area here where their belly and intestines are. You can't squish hard enough. Okay. And okay. number two, what's going to hurt them is that food not That's coming true. out. All and right. what you want to do is you want to keep grasping and doing that until it pops out. Okay. If it doesn't pop out for some reason and they pass out, then lay them on the floor and start CPR. Scary. Someone should be calling 911 that whole time. Okay. All right. Dr. All right. John, is there a situation where you could even take your finger and stick it down their throat if you can? You do not want to do that because don't. the problem is if you see food, you can pull it out once they've passed out. Only if you see it. Okay. You don't want to stick your finger in there because you could push it further in. Got it. That Got is it. bad. So okay. just again, just keep pushing. All right. Let's 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 talk about this guy. Looks like he's, he's, he's seen better days as well. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the reality of the situation is we're having mass shootings. We're having a lot of gunshots. Right. You could be at a concert. You could be at an office. You could be walking down the street. Somebody gets shot or they get hurt in some kind of of industrial accident or car accident so and they're bleeding. bleeding right you need to stop the bleeding immediately and there are a few things here you can use for a makeshift tourniquet because you know in the military i use tourniquets that are made for this but you don't always have those with you nobody does but you might have a tie a t-shirt some socks i mean just think about any kind of things you can use and the pins so we're going to try this on and give me this tie real quick all right and i'll show you how to make a so makeshift what's the tourniquet. goal here the Remind goal here is people. to stop the bleeding so assuming he got a gunshot wound somewhere in the leg here you want to try and stop the bleeding within a few minutes because they're going to bleed to death very very quickly and what you want to do is wrap something around people think belts belts do not work can you give me those two pens there sure please? sure belts don't work belts don't work they're too hard to twist and the twisting mechanism is what actually stops the bleeding twisting so what you want to do one oh. pin won't work two pins work great and then you want to just oh twist gosh. and twist as and twist as, as tight as you can Jeez. until the bleeding stops now oh if i let go it's going to untwist so give me the shoestrings shoestrings right, right. And just give me a shoestring here. And what you want to do is get the shoestring, tie it around, oh, and then secure goodness. that in place. 
The whole time you're doing this, as you're getting these instruments ready, which you just saw, it took a few minutes to get them ready, have somebody else supply, apply direct pressure, because that direct pressure is going to stop this from bleeding. Direct pressure on the wound. On the wound while the tourniquet's being put in place. Oh Call 911, obviously. And then if it, even if it doesn't stop bleeding, yeah. you can go ahead and continue to apply direct pressure. It's going to slow it down. That's the important mm. thing until help gets there. And if you don't have a towel, you could use a stretchy sock. A stretchy sock you can use. You can use a T-shirt. Okay. Anything. Sleeves of your long sleeve shirt. Any of those can really work to put the tourniquet on. I just learned a lot there. Let's yeah. walk to another situation. You're in the park. You're with family, friends, loved ones, even a stranger. You see they fall to the ground. They're having a seizure. What do you do? So there's a misconception that when people have seizures, it's an old myth that you want to put something in their mouth to stop them from swallowing their tongue. Number one, those muscles that control their mouth are one of the biggest muscles in our body. You are not going to get the mouth open. It's going to see shut. Every muscle is tightened. Ah. It's going to see shut. You're just going to break teeth and cause problems. So don't put anything in their mouth. What you want to do is essentially ride out the seizure. It's only going to last a few minutes if they're somebody with seizure disorders or they have a seizure. So does that mean stand back or can you no. help in some? You want to help. Two things you want to do. Number one, first, most important, you want to protect the head. So give me that real quick. Sweatshirt. This is a sweatshirt, any kind of blanket or anything, and just put it down under their head and protect their head. The other thing they're going to do is they're going to be moving around a whole lot and thrashing around. So you don't want to hold their arms still because you're not going to be able to, right. or you're going to cause injuries, but you don't want them to get hurt. So just clear out anything from the area. So the gist is you causing. don't want to hold them down, no. like allow them to seize out, but also don't let them hurt themselves further. Exactly. And that's the main point. Just r help them end the seizure. Just help them ride the seizure out. Okay, main so thing, protect the head, protect the arms, protect the legs. So I'm, and then once they're done with the seizure, yeah, they have so when it's stopped, post, then when is it appropriate to engage? It's called a post-ictal state. They're going to have about 15 minutes of grogginess, not being very awake. So what you want to do is you want to go ahead and then just roll them on their side and let them sit there because they might throw up and Scary. you don't want them to choke on it. So roll them on their side, keep assuring them that they're going to be okay, call an ambulance, and then go from there. It's a good reminder to the other good Samaritans who are walking by to get engaged yeah. and well and call for help so others can help whoever is And that's with all of there. them. Thanks. Help is important, getting the whole community in there. You're probably never going to be at one place by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're going to be at a place Thank where you. people can help. Like I said, with tourniquets, direct pressure. Yeah. You want to make sure that's applied appropriate. Somebody can help you here. People tend to panic in situations like this. Yes. Of course. So if you're the one that can take a couple breaths and really slow things down, you're great. the one that's going to help yeah, out. That was good Dr. advice. Torres, Thanks, thank, thank you. you and we want to thank World Point and Laredell Medical for lending us these mannequins for this important demonstration. How, just really quickly, how can you tell if you come upon someone that they're actually having a seizure and it's not? Well, you can see a seizure is a full brain activity where their brain is just firing completely. And so everything is moving around. They're either stiff where they have what's called tonic-clonic, where they're just moving all their extremities. Okay. Their, their jaws are clenched. They're not talking to you. They're not listening to you. They're not doing anything. Got it. That's a seizure. That's important. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Jones. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. Boys 
Jackson back in town. It's a miracle. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on Today. The City Concert Series on Today is proudly presented to you by City. And we're back with twice the first all-woman K-pop group to ever sell out a stadium in North America. All right, but before Twice takes our stage for the very first time, here is a look at the group's journey to becoming a global sensation. Twice is on cloud nine. The K-pop sensation blowing up the charts with hits like The Feels. And Moonlight Sunrise. They've already racked up over 5 billion YouTube views and almost 70 million combined social media followers. Composed of nine members, the group first shot to fame after competing on a Korean TV show in 2015, and their catchy hits spread across the globe. Twice was the first K-pop group to receive the Billboard Women in Music Breakthrough Award. Wow, thank you. Last year, they became the first female K-pop group to sell out a stadium in North America. For their latest album, even the Empire State Building was lit up in the group's official colors. Now, Twice is on a sellout world tour. And this morning, the ladies are stopping off right here on our plaza for their Today Show debut. All right, from their most recent album, Ready to Be, here's Twice with Set Me Free.
just getting started here in our plaza twice. We'll treat us to more right after this. But first, this is Today on NBC. K-pop group it's been touring the world and we just want to take a few moments to actually meet the members yes. of Twice so can you each just introduce yourselves Okay nice. One, two, three. Why not me? Hi, we are Twice. Twice. Hello, I'm Jonghyun. Let's have a fun today. See you all and have a great time today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jia. So glad to be here. Please enjoy our show today. Hi, I'm Paya. Thanks for coming today. And I hope you're <laughs> and I hope you enjoy our stays. Thank you. Hi, I'm Naya. I'm so happy to be here today. Hi, I'm Chewy. I'm so happy to be here and please enjoy our next song too. Thank you. I mean, that was amazing. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, twice. Oh my goodness. Wow. And you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. There are posters for each one of them. Oh, I yeah. mean, you guys have fans all the way to as far as the eye can see. That's great. We've kept your waiting long enough. Ladies and gentlemen, twice with Moonlight Sunrise. We're soaring into the Billboard Top 100. Love, cause in 
nobody but us So I, so I, so I See you from across the room Think no way over to you I'm tripping over butterflies twice with more music for us right after this but first this is today on NBC Good morning, welcome to you today. What's shaking eggs and bacon? Hold what? on, I'm just gonna say it. What? Badass. Oh, thank you. So do you think you'll act forever? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> We're gonna have lots of fun yeah. this morning. Yeah. 
This has been so fun. We're back on this Wednesday morning with international superstars twice. And now twice is going to perform a third time with what Billboard called one of the best songs of 2021, Alcohol Free. Let's hear it once again for twice. to the band as well. Thank the you, band. thank you. And to all of you, ahead in our third hour and annual tradition, the winners of Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest are with us. We'll do a morning after check-in with the champions, Joey Chestnut and Mickey Sudo, and then on Hoda and Jenna, romantic date ideas and vacation getaways. We're back after your local news. Twice! Twice!
This morning on the third hour of today, wild weather from coast to coast. Severe storms lit up the skies with their own 4th of July show, even postponing Nathan's famous hot dog eating contest on Coney Island. As soon as we saw that first lightning, that's it, cut it off. The competition delayed, but not canceled. While 31 million Americans are sweating it out in the southeast and west, Rain or shine, nothing dampened the American spirit, though, on this 4th of July. And then later, we're stepping up our summer workouts and start today, unveiling our July workout plan. And the wait is over. The summer's biggest blockbuster is about to hit theaters. With all the action, nostalgia, and drama we can handle. That's all ahead today, Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning and welcome to the third hour of today. The gang's all here. Well, well the gang's kind of not here. Yeah. Yeah. The Still. most important part of the gang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, the gang is definitely not yeah. all here. Yeah. You know why? Because for the first time, he's enjoying his time as Pop Pop. As Pop Pop. Yes. Pop, Pop. Oh my goodness. Welcome to his uh, granddaughter. She was born over the holiday weekend. He is so happy. Yes. I, I texted him the next day after she was born. No. I said, did you wake up and your heart flip? Because you know you have this beautiful smelling little baby. She he said, I just, I need to already plan my next chance to see her. Oh, Sky. It's so Sky sweet. Sky Clara. And Beautiful Dylan name. already sent a copy of Misty the Cloud. I bet you did. Her. But with a name like Sky, yeah. right? Oh, man, yeah. there are some clouds to fill. Trust me, Sky is going to be her own children's book eventually. It's true. We're celebrating that. We're also celebrating that concert. It was so much fun. Is this the first time we've had bubbles on the plaza? I think so. I think so. A lot I think of bubbles. So. Yes. Um, twice, the K pop group lighting up our plaza. Um, they're performing in New York City, I think, tomorrow, right? Met at MetLife tomorrow. Yeah. Met like tomorrow. Sold out. So right? many of you yeah, have sold out. So many people are saying, see you tomorrow. But there were signs for each each young lady. I mean, yes. so they each have their, their fans. And one of the girls you talked to, two of them, were outside yesterday at 8 a.m. I saw them when I was leaving yesterday. And they, they were already first in line. So I'm glad they got Jeez. front row seats to, to see them perform. All right. Well, yeah. the day after Fourth of July, it feels like what'd you say? The holiday week. It holiday feels week. like we're. It was on a Tuesday, so yeah. I feel like it's been going since Saturday. We're gonna keep it yes. going. How'd you celebrate? Yeah. Um, I have family in town. Brian, Brian's side of the family came down. Some nieces and nephews. We went to a parade in a, in a little town, and um, I mean, it was just. They just had so much fun. I mean, like, no shirts. You're missing no a problem. child in that picture. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh that's why she's missing one. <laughs> that, oh, that's... that's what the fire trucks during oh. a parade do to little rest. Oh, you didn't like the fire trucks? It just, they're so loud. They are loud. Um, so I was concerned. You, you know what? This there, is but everybody what, was just, I mean, this was just, yeah. it was just a perfect little weekend yeah. with the family. What about yes. for you? Uh, so it, we split it. Yesterday, my, my family went down to Washington, D.C. to spend some time with their grandparents and my uh, uh, brother-in-law and his kids. And uh, But this was the scene on oh. Thursday at our fireworks show in, in town. A uh, little Sybil there with her, with her friend Hope. And uh, this is them at the nation's capital yesterday. Delano decided he didn't want to have his picture taken. That okay. makes it artistic. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So he's enjoying the monuments. And then this uh, next picture, I don't know. There, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah. What about the port? Didn't you, like, sit home alone? And there then, it oh, is. Oh, the, what is this? Oh, yeah. So Dell's taking up golf. Okay. So he was... Uh, Who needs a shirt for golf, He got right? a little lesson. Then he a little, little chip. Yeah. You got a chip there. Hey. Got under the on green. the green. If only I could do that. Uh, me and you both. <laughs> so, so, yes, it was a full, Very fun good. weekend. Yeah. How about you? I need to level up on my picture game. Because I... <laughs> I just have so much fun that I go, oh, shoot, on Sunday night. Guys, somebody take a picture with yeah. me. And the kids are like, no, Mom. Oh. You have so, to think about the day after. Exactly. The, so this guy, I was like, I'll give you uh, a donut if you take a picture with me. <laughs> and he's like, oh, OK. It's a so great picture. Yes, yeah. yeah, so there it's you go. It's a frameable picture. And then all the, so my son's soccer team was there. My youngest son's soccer team was there. So all the parents, we were just eating out and having a great time That's while so the kids fun. were playing. A lot of Monopoly, because it was a lot of rain, yeah. like, off and on. Mm -hmm. So he was just excited to have kids play Monopoly with him. But it was yeah. a, House full of kids. Eight kids in the house. This All week. Right. That's great. Well, we there hope you, you enjoyed your 4th of July as well, even though, as you mentioned, rain was a part of the forecast for a lot of folks. Uh, in New York City, though, it did clear up. Not the story for much of the country, though. 30 million Americans mm. at risk of more storms today. NBC's Emily Akata has been tracking it all for us for the last few days. Joins us once again from the, the site of the big hot dog eating contest yesterday. More on that in just a moment. But Coney Island is where Emily is. Emily, good morning. 
Good morning to you all. The severe weather continuing to snarl travel and put a damper on so many holiday festivities throughout the week. Now we're seeing air quality alerts pop up from the Midwest today over to the East Coast. You can see some of the haziness behind me. But we saw the sweeping storms yesterday here in Coney Island take a dangerous turn. Two people were rushed to the hospital after a lightning strike in the area. And now more severe weather is taking aim at the Midwest today. Mother Nature lit up the nation's skies with 4th of July fireworks all her own. As millions from coast to coast dealt with a holiday full of extreme heat and severe storms. From the Rockies to the East Coast, scattered storms disrupted a host of Independence Day festivities, clearing out beaches in New Jersey and abruptly pausing Coney Island's famed hot dog eating contest. As soon as we saw that first lightning, that's it, cut it off. Nearby, the New York Fire Department reporting two people were rushed to the hospital after a lightning strike. Out west, it was the scorching heat that put a damper on holiday plans, fueling wildfires in Washington and Arizona and canceling some nearby 4th of July events. At the nation's airports, more than 450 flights canceled and another 4,200 delayed Tuesday. At one point, there were ground stops at all three of New York City's major airports, adding to a week of travel chaos amid record holiday travel. NBC News learning United Airlines plans to reduce its schedule to give even more spare gates and buffer, especially during thunderstorm season. But despite the wild weather, Americans' patriotism shining through. Baseball fans singing during a rainy game at Fenway Park. And the USS Constitution, the Navy's oldest commissioned warship, setting sail under stormy skies. Happy Fourth! Love you! God bless you! As families and friends flock to the beach, barbecues, and fireworks. Dazzling skylines nationwide celebrating America's 247th birthday. And for those beginning to make their way back home, remember you will be in good company. A record 50 plus million people traveled for July 4th. Many of those taking to the roads. If you're heading back out on the roadway today, AAA says you want to do so before 2 p.m. to avoid the worst of traffic. And if you're heading to the airport, be prepared for long lines, potential wait times. You want to get there early. TSA screen 2.7 million passengers each day over the July 4th weekend. So you should be bracing for potential travel snags as more severe weather makes its way into the Midwest. Guys. All right. Emily Ketterforce there on Coney Island. Thank you, Thank Emily. You, Emily. Take a look at the map. Yeah, we do have uh, more storms in the forecast today, unfortunately. But right back through the middle of the country, so this does include Chicago, St. Louis, stretches back through uh, Kansas into Oklahoma, parts of Texas, too. We could see large hail damaging winds, the biggest threat. But look at how hot it's going to be mm -hmm. all spread out across the country. It looks like we've got heat advisories and heat warnings out west, down the southwest, in the middle of the country. Temperatures say will likely uh, tie or break some records. I mean, hundreds in the Pacific Northwest, near 100. Uh, with the humidity, it's going to feel like it's over 100 along the Gulf Coast and even in the mm. Northeast will be up around 90 degrees today. My goodness. Summer's here. Have to hang yeah. in there. All right. Well, the rain may have postponed the men's competition in Nathan's 4th of July hot dog eating contest. Let's just say 4th. Leave you alone. Sorry. But even Mother Nature couldn't stop these eating <laughs> machines. We're joined by, come on down, 16 yes. time 16 champion. Times. 16 times. Not fours, 16 time champion Joey Chestnut who, let me just say, crushed the competition yesterday, eating 62 hot dogs in just 10 minutes. And from the women's division, we have nine-time nine champ times. Vicky Sudo, who took beast. home Thanks. the pink belt once again, thanks to her impressive 39 and a half hot dog total. Congratulations to both of you. Congrats, guys. Oh, thank you. Do you ever get tired of winning? I feel like you guys are like the rock stars. No, it's the best job in the world. Really? Yeah, I get to eat and beat people. <laughs> and, and yeah, have a good time. And I always like, like how you explain how you feel the next morning or how you explain it. I can't even imagine what you feel like this morning after I, all those hot dogs. I go in knowing that I'm not going to feel great for. So couple, like, what a do you feel days. like right now? What's the what is I'm, the? I'm lethargic. A little bit drunk on food. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just bloated. But you know what? Yeah. You got a belt, though. So. I got the win. I got yeah, the win, exactly. baby. Vicky, you, you look great. Like, you don't look like you I, ate I a few was, dozen hot dogs I yesterday. I 40 to his 60 this something. This is not fair. Yeah. What? How? Yeah, I don't know how you look at, at, like that. After. I don't know. Hot dogs can be very slimming. I dress strategically. <laughs> I'm one of the hot dog I, I mean, I'm a little bloated, too, but I'm still on that, that high for me. Yeah. It was such a great event. 
Pepsi was a sponsor, which was perfect. Um, yeah, I'm I got sure. pushed for. Uh, My whole family was surrounded, just surrounded the TV yesterday. We saw you. You got to play. You got to compete before the rain hit. Then you had to like sit around for oh hours. God. I mean, how did that impact? Dude, it was you? it was scary. Like like it was like I was telling people like, oh, they're just gonna delay it. And then all of a sudden, I heard George Shea announce like, oh, the thing, everything's canceled. Oh, they canceled because, for a moment. But they, 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 because okay. lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. and the lightning strikes are a serious deal. And yeah. so they have to they have to clear out the audience. And uh, yeah, it, it was it was scary. And uh, but it all works out. Right. As long as you, it, it, well, you have, you have to Joey, do it. Joey, we, we got to ask you. I mean, this is your 19th. 19th win. Have you considered retiring, uh, hanging up the jersey, or are you going to keep going? Oh, my God. I I, I have some goals. Oh, and yeah. I, I, and What's I, left? I, I mean, that, that 80 number is. It, it, really? It, it sounds, it sounds beautiful. And I, I know I can do it, with, even even if nobody's pushing me. Yeah, you just say, there's just so much time. And, okay, Mickey, real saying, quick. I know your son Max is here. Yay. He was cheering you on. Oh, Look at him. Oh, He's just has so Mick wearing me down the guy stage. Oh, yeah, I saw I saw him on the stage yesterday too. I mean, it was just so sweet. Thank you. What's he got? Little Max, Max, I'm turning to on July eighth. Uh, but yeah, I've got my own little cheering section right there. That's so beautiful, awesome. little baby. That's Congrats awesome. again. Thank Congratulations, you. Congratulations to both of you guys. We always love Probably not going to have hot year. dogs for a Thank while, you. right? A <laughs> couple <laughs> days. A couple yeah. days. We'll wait a little bit. So Michael Jordan and Serena Williams have Pretty much. <laughs> It's a great event on both sides. I can't wait for next year. Yeah, I love it. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm sure we'll see you next year. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, coming up next, if you've got aches and pains in your body, we have the tools for you. Physical therapy techniques you can use right at home to get the relief you need. And then later, Craig met a woman who is stirring up the whiskey game, how she broke through the male-dominated space and certainly made a name for herself. We'll be right back. Welcome back. If your July 4th festivities included some exercise, outdoor activities perhaps, and you're feeling a little out of sorts this morning, we have something for you. Yes. All right. So on today's checklist, we are talking physical therapy tools, what they are, how they can help you relieve some of those aches and pains. So joining us is Karina Wu, a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedic physical therapy. So she knows what she's talking about. Karina, good morning. Welcome good morning. Back. All right. So these are things that we, a lot of them we can have at home, right? Absolutely, when you're aching and painting. Um, let's start with the foam roller. You got first of all, why is it important? Talk about this to use some of these physical therapy tools. You know, you can do it with your hands, but it just doesn't really get in there. So these tools are great because people use them for muscle tightness, yeah. stiffness, and pains. If you have a minor injury, of course, for physical therapy, almost every patient is gonna get those. If you have overdone it with exercise, this is also a great way to flush out that lactic acid and help reduce your perception so of pain. So is that essentially what you're doing with the foam roller? You're just flushing it out? Because I feel like it kind of hurts. These are all self-massage pieces of equipment. Okay, These I'm gonna let you do it. I've got exercises. heels yes. on today. So, uh, yeah, so for the foam roller, this is a great exercise tool because you can do anything on it. You can move your soft tissues, you can mobilize your joints, okay. you can do stability and balance exercises. So for this demonstration, mm -hmm. we're gonna open up our middle back. So 
What does that do? So what we're doing here is we're backward bending uh -huh. over it. Uh -huh. We're supporting our head with our hands and we're just sort of gently backward bending. And this is great because it reverses the curve of poor posture. Probably feels good, mm. yes. doesn't it? Yes, yes. And then if you lift your bottom up and just mm. sort of roll it out, just like this, you get the massage aspect. So mm. who's a good candidate for this exercise that you're doing? This is great for anyone with neck pains, middle back pains, yeah. shoulder pains. I'm a huge fan of the foam pain. roller. Anyone, huge fan. Anyone, anyone with minor injuries is doing this exercise. Right, Karina, let's turn. talk about these little balls here um, because you maintain they can do wonders if you've been like out on a hike or you've been on your feet perhaps more than usual. Yes. So lacrosse balls oh, are great because okay. they give pinpoint pressure. It's a smaller surface area. They get hard to reach places like That's muscle good. insertion points. And then if you're using them in other areas like your glutes, you can actually do movement with it. So you get that myofascial release. So Ooh. you're going to just hold it. You can just either roll it back and forth mm -hmm. or you can just drop your body weight on it and just stay static oh, and let your yeah, foot relax great. over really? it. So that's girls good. in heels, yeah. Yeah. this is great when your toes, the forefoot is bunched up. If you just put it right I'm under- shoe off. I'm doing both. <laughs> If you put it right under the ball of the foot, it actually helps spread the metatarsal heads. Hmm. So it reduces that compression that you have in the front. I need to try oh, that. But people man. with plantar fasciitis, that's, okay. this is a great exercise. You're selling it. You, or you wanted to show us your pink and gray socks. No, no, <laughs> don't, don't hate on my it's socks. Really <laughs> it's really comfortable. It's really comfortable. Hey, you but know, what are the tennis balls for? You can see it on them it's really simple you it. can use a tennis ball you can get this is how you get into the glute here you can just come down here you put it right in the middle of the buttock and then if you just move your leg out and in huh this is gonna get that this oh he's doing it with Do me it. I'm yes gonna I'm gonna so, make sure we zoom while, in. while you guys do that. Okay. Yes. Ooh, yes. Yes. So you can do it like that, or you can also get on your iliotibial band, that big that tendon is. on the side. Oh. And, and what is that doing? It's just getting back. like a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Not this a trigger is, point. This but. is more pinpoint and harder to reach places. And people who want more of that like stronger force, oh, because yeah. the foam roller is a little bit more, okay. uh, oh, there's good. larger surface area, so it disperses the force. Oh, wait, they said 30 seconds. We got to hurry. Yes. This, I just picked this up not knowing what it was, but yes. this feels so good yes. on so my back. That's another way of doing deep pressure mm -hmm. massage like shiatsu style or trigger point. This is great because it's very low energy. Mm -hmm. So you're going to just drive it in. Again, it can be used in the whole body. Mm -hmm. So this oh. massage cane is great. And then we also have a massage gun these here. These are intimidating. How did these oh, these I've are got those. swear right by this. Oh, yes. those are amazing. Is that a high price? There's three That's speeds great. for this one. Yeah. And you're gonna, again, with all these tools, you're on soft tissue anywhere. Uh, maybe not around there. Just a little, it's too, it's too small and that might be a little bit too much. Maybe that's the so problem. massage guns are great because oh, they increase nice. circulation yeah. without increasing your heart rate or like, the work effort. And it really so, works. Like I'll yeah. You know, pain, there is and a then I'll study, there. Yeah. yes, that shows that it huh. significantly increases the circulation there with less effort. If you use it on the highest speed and for about five minutes. Karina, thank great. you so much. These were wonderful. I was just about to say, you have winners here. Oh, there yes. you go. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Well, just ahead right. now that we're all limber. I know. I had a very special assignment, folks. I had the chance to meet a chemical engineer who is now changing the bourbon business. What it means to be a super taster. Mm. We're coming up a little bit later. We're going to... We're gonna be uh, breaking a sweat again, apparently, today, yeah. and start today. Stephanie Mansour is <laughs> back. Okay. She's back with some community members and a new July workout that you do not want to miss. Third hour of today, right back after this.
We're back now with a really cool story. Craig, you got an assignment right down in Kentucky, uh, sharing some bourbon with a woman who is making history in the world of whiskey. Sometimes you have to take one for the team, right? Yeah. Uh, her name, and remember this name, her name is Marianne Eves. She wasn't born into the world of distilling, but as Kentucky's very first female master distiller of bourbon, her expertise and palate are sought after the world over. Now, Marianne is set to release her own brand, and she gave us a taste. Time moves pretty fast in this day and age, but not here in the Rick Houses of Kentucky. Giant buildings where barrels of bourbon whiskey sit aging. The process of distilling bourbon is steeped in tradition, but things are changing. Meet Mary Ann Eves, Kentucky's first female master distiller of bourbon. Trained as a chemical engineer, Mary Ann got her start at distilling giant brown foreman. It was there she discovered she also had a special palate, making her a super taster. Did you train your palate or were you just born with it? So I know naturally I have a really sensitive sense of smell, which is about four fifths of your ability to taste. So if you've got a regular palate and you're asking what sets bourbon apart from other whiskeys, Let's let the master distiller answer that one. All bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. It has to be at least 51% corn, go in a new charred oak barrel, can't be distilled above 160 proof, can't be bottled any lower than 80 proof. You can't add anything to it by water. It's a recipe for success with the global bourbon market valued at nearly $8 billion. Mary Ann was on the fast track, in line to become the next master distiller at Woodford Reserve. Then, she decided to make a switch, joining the equivalent of a startup in the bourbon world at Castle and Key. Castle and Key? Yes. What'd you do there? I was the master distiller at Castle and Key. It was built in the late 1800s. It was being reclaimed by nature. The roof was collapsing, the windows were caved in, so it was really kind of resurrecting the distillery. It was then that Mary Ann took the title Master Distiller, which drew some criticism. Criticism that bourbon expert Fred Minnick says is misguided. Did Mary Ann earn it? A lot of people at that time were like, has she earned it? She's far more qualified than 75, 80% of the people in this country who have that title. After four years, Mary Ann went out on her own, working as a consultant, including helping develop a brand of Tennessee whiskey for football great Peyton Manning. She also started a family and now holds the title of mom to two little girls. Marianne's latest project is being a partner in a new bourbon brand called Forbidden. It's special because Marianne was involved in every aspect while distilling it at the Bardstown Bourbon Company facilities. Tell me about Forbidden. <laughs> Forbidden, the name really speaks to, I think, my journey in the industry, doing things, approaching things differently, but also just being forbidden as a woman to do this job. How long have you been working on the recipe? I started developing the recipe for this back in 2016. It's taken seven years. Yeah. Mary Ann took us to the Rick House to try some. Mary Ann, what are we about to do here? So we're going to open up this barrel so that we can taste it. Okay. And you and I are going to decide whether this is good enough to be a single barrel. <laughs> this is a tough assignment. <laughs> All right. Whoa. Oh, yeah. So this is the five-year yeah. forbidden. Five-year forbidden. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> That's actually really good. It's pretty good. And you know it's good. It's good. You, you know it's good. <laughs> you could sell this now. You don't have to put it yeah. back in, do you? We're going to put a single barrel stamp right on it. A Craig Melvin barrel. It's going to be very expensive. <laughs> it's going to be very expensive. That's really good. Seriously. Cheers. Cheers. Well Thank done. You. So happy, yeah, you look so that, you're so exhilarated. I'm telling you, <laughs> this, you know, you know, I like a, a nice glass of bourbon. This is, and I don't say this lightly, this is some of the best bourbon mm. I've ever had. I will say, I, is, I typically do not like bourbon, and I've been sipping this during that whole story. It is, it's sweet, it, but it doesn't burn. Yes, 
it's really delicious. It's approachable. Yes. It's an approachable bourbon. And as much as you talk about bourbon on the show, that's for you to say that. Yeah. Obviously, that means a lot. So, and I love the bottle, too. So anyway, Forbidden. Um, oh, you can buy the Forbidden single barrel at select stores across Kentucky and South Carolina. And it's also available for purchase on bourbonoutfitter.com. But I, it's probably it going to really become good. pretty hard to find and pretty expensive. Yeah, so. good. I should put that down, though, because that, that's strong. dangerous. All right, coming up next, we are stepping up our fitness level. Start today contributor Stephanie Mann. Mansoor is ready to kick off our new July workout plan with some upper body strengthening. And it's the easy way to tone your arms, Ooh. whether at home or on the road. And what better way to accessorize your summer bod than with some fun summer finds? Our lifestyle uh. expert, Cassie Post, there she is, has six products you do not want to miss this season. You want a massage yeah. while you're down? I know. What is, is that? an outdoor massage chair. <laughs> today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. And that's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. We are back with Start Today. Our July challenge has begun combining our walking routine with upper body strength training. And it's not too late to join our today Start Today family. Grab your phone and scan the QR code on your screen. We already have more than half a million Start Today members who get this newsletter. And when you sign up, you'll be cheered on by Today Fitness contributor Stephanie Mansour, who is here uh, with our Start Today community members. As Look how we bring our team I to know. the show. It's so much fun. <laughs> we have Josie and Mary. Good morning, guys. Good Mary morning. Beth. Good morning. It's so nice to have you here. So, Steph, why is it so important to work in upper body and how yes. much should we be doing it? You know, we work the lower body when we're walking, right? It's part cardio, part strength training. But now it's time to balance things out. So we're going to work the upper body. And I know it's summertime. I know we're all busy. So it's only 10 minutes, not even every day, every other day. And you get okay. to pick dumbbells or resistance bands. What do you okay. like? What do you like better? Well, I personally prefer dumbbells if you're starting off because it's a little easier to control. Control. The resistance bands take a little bit more coordination, but the resistance bands actually work the muscles on the way up and down, oh, the concentric and up. eccentric. Yes, great yeah. job, Craig. I love those bicep curls. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> so Josie has a question, and this yeah. is a common one, so I'm happy you're here Hi, to Josie. ask. Hi. Uh, so most ladies, and you know, that little area back there, the triceps, yes. I really like dumbbells, bands, which yeah. is more effective? Which is more effective, that's a great question. And I actually like to target this stubborn area with both. So we're gonna start with resistance bands. We're gonna bend forward here with the feet as wide as the hips, abs drawn in, elbows hug in, and we're gonna do tricep kickbacks, kicking the arms back and coming to center, good. So we're working that upper arm here. Do you feel that right there, Josie, tightening up? Yes, so we do this for 10 repetitions and then we stop and move on. But I also wanna show us how to do this with the resistance bands. So I'm going to give everyone a resistance band here. And again, this is a takes a little bit more coordination. So that's why I recommend starting with dumbbells if you're a beginner. But for resistance bands, we're going to crunch this up and hold it up at your chest. Oh. And then we're going to hold on above the handle. Good. And then we're going to kick the arm back. Oh. Perfect. And come to center. Hugging that elbow yeah, in. Feel it on the, yes. Like pull down and then the release. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you feel the resistance on the way up too. Yeah. So I love this. And you can get this into 
entire workout plan and workout videos that go with this over on today.com slash start today. Resistance bands are great because you can travel with them. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And they don't take up a lot of space in your house. Yes, yeah. just stash them in your heavy. suitcase. Mary not Beth, heavy. Exactly. Yeah. Mary <laughs> Beth, you're from Cheshire, Connecticut. I am. From the Nutmeg State. What's, right. your, uh, what's your question? So my question is, I love my bike and I do a lot of biking, but I have a touring bike and so I'm often hunched over the handlebars. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like to focus on my posture this summer. Yes. What do you recommend? What is the best approach for that? Yes. So I'm going to have us grab our dumbbells again. And these exercises are great for anyone who's sitting at a desk or even sitting on the couch. And you know, Mary Beth, you shared with me earlier that Start Today has really helped you get out of a workout rut. You're yes. waking up, you're going out, getting active and feeling I'm so much walking, better. I'm walking through Cheshire. Yes, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so the first exercise we're going to do is a lateral raise. So we're going to hold the weights down, abs in again, feet as wide as the hips. We're going to lift the arms up towards the, as high as the shoulders and lower down. Good. Now, a common mistake people make here, guys, is engaging those trapezius muscles up here, the neck. We don't want to do that. Instead, we want to slowly lift up, working the delts, working the shoulders there. Do you feel that? I do. Yes. And this is Definitely. helping build that upper body strength so we have better posture. And one more exercise is an overhead press. Arms start at a 90 degree angle. We press up. Make sure you can see them in your peripheral vision and then come back down. Again, releasing those trapezius muscles. Perfect. Not lifting too heavy. We're all starting with three pound weights, but you can go up to five, six, seven pounds. But this looks great. And we do 10 repetitions and then set them down and repeat the whole circuit for 10 minutes. I love it. Thank Stuff you so much. Great. This thank is you. so great. Josie yes. and Mary Beth, thank you so thank much you for being here. And thank you guys. Keep up the good work. Part of our yeah. family. Yeah. All right. Now that we've worked out, up next, your fun summer finds. We're talking about the hat of the summer, Ooh. some flashlights yes. for your feet. Ooh. Our lifestyle expert, Chassie Post, has some, some cool new fun summer products that you just really have to check out. I'm here for and that then hat. A little bit later, who knew all the summer action this summer was going to be in the movie theater. The biggest and most anticipated blockbusters like Mission Impossible, Barbie, they're about to hit the big screen. You don't have to wait. We're going to give you a preview. Third hour of today, right back after this. Welcome back. We have some fun summer finds for you this morning from making some refreshing iced tea in a new way to lighting up your own pathway with your own two feet. Our life, because why wouldn't you want to do that? Lifestyle expert Chassie Post is here. I love all of these ideas. Through. Hi. So I, so I am so excited. Okay, so first up, we were yes. talking about iced tea, a summer mm -hmm. staple, right? But it could be easier to make. Like, you know, normally all those little tea bags, yes, the strings. Yes, unwrap each one. Not anymore from Great Origins. They're making pitcher tea bags. Genius. Oh, that's genius, so right? Genius. And you make it right in the pitcher. Mm -hmm. You know, you throw in the I this large it. tea bag. We're talking about making sun tea yes. like our grandparents used to do, and this is just the perfect way to do it. So much easier when a big, you know, group is coming over. You yes. need a large we fat. We say yes. Yes. And great. They have all the different yes. options. And flavors. yes, they're organic, premium. So many great options from green tea to hibiscus. Chassis, yes. this is this is fantastic. So my cute, daughter's right? gonna love this. Everyone's gonna love this. This is probably one of my favorite Amazon finds ever. And 
Katie Stilo, our Katie Stilo. producer, oh gosh, is rocking night. them. These are Croc headlights, this flashlights for your feet. And that these are so her cute. own. These she, are my pair. I've had oh, these. really? I've had these for months. Yeah, and actually the power went out of my sister's yesterday, and I wish I had these. <laughs> Thank so I can. You. Also, I like the way. Yes. Walking your dog. Also, yes. there's like a fun mode, okay? okay. Watch this. Wait party for mode. Oh, 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 oh. Party you can bring the party so in the sport croc mode and party mode. Yeah. Like exactly. Having a great time. Can you make some of those cocktails yeah. you guys, make? guess what else? Yes. They say that they light up to 30 feet in front wow. of them. So that's incredible. Okay. We say okay. yes. Thank, Thank you, you Katie. Sports. All right, so this is the hat of the summer. Have you guys been seeing the lifeguard hat? Is that it what is, that is unisex, yes. And guess what? It looks great on everyone. Yeah. If you want to try, you know you love a hat. Guy. I, I know. So I'm a hat Chanel, person. these are so I'll good. These are from a company Ooh. called Brixton, and they're vintage. They're pattern on the vintage mm -hmm. lifeguard hat. They're so stylish and UPF. 50 wow. plus oh. protected. And they create so much shade around your face. So it's, much it's shade really and $30 that come Beyonce? in four different okay. sizes. Oh. Yeah, I feel left out. I've, I gotta wear one too. Okay, so thank you for like, understanding. I have to tell you guys, I fell bags. in love with these. These are from Burke Decor and they're made oh. out of recycled plastic. Oh, How great is great. that? So they're indestructible. And strong handles. Yes, and I love Burke Decor. So many treasures from around the world. Thank and you. these are actually from a Japanese company inspired by Indian um, storage bags with mm. these beautiful stripes. So even the grocery store. So great, yeah, so you and can you hold can the hose them there. down. Just forty-two dollars. Oh, okay, geez. how great are these, Chanel? Oh. This is sure. This, you know why I love oh, this? Oh, this. this. So is so always stealing my towel. Yes, and these are <laughs> oh, from a company called Preppy Jones, and these are Preppy fabulous. Jones? Yes. Oh my God. Isn't that fun? Oh. And you can choose from all sorts of designs. Oh, that is, and we've got a great this one for cool. Craig. Look, Chanel's got for SJ. Right? Isn't that cute? <laughs> and guess what? I think they look I so expensive, Super but they're cute. just $29.99. And nobody and, can take it. No, and the brand is offering us a special code, 20% okay. off Ooh. with... Uh, uh, preppy today. This is okay. A, a look at gift. Craig now, guys. This Farmer this Craig is over here. <laughs> the greatest invention that has ever happened for a lounge chair. Okay. These are by oh, oh. Oh, Ostrich. So you can see they have many different the options. These are go. by Ostrich, guys. Wait, and I love the like. I love the face hole. Yes. So they are What's face, with the face hole? down. So you, so you can use them regular or face down. Look, oh, and Dylan, their armholes. Would you, you like a massage? Oh, this is Look great. at that armhole, so Look, you can, can read. read a book like use this. your tablet. I mean, these this are so genius. Or this you can great. flip. All right. The pillow over. Jackie, these were great. great. Isn't this awesome? I love it. All right. So if you want some of these That's products, so cool. just head to today.com right, so slash shop. And the hats. We still have time in the show. I guess we do. Up next, it's a big month for films. Clear your calendar because get up. this year's hottest films are all jam-packed in the next few weeks. We're going to give you a preview okay. coming up after the break. Why do you need the armholes? You can't get up. clear your calendar because we are heading to the movie theater. That's right. Here to give us a pre preview of the hottest July films, our friend and NBC News entertainment contributor, Chris Witherspoon. Chris, also the founder and CEO of that entertainment app. It's called Pop Viewers. Good to have you back. Good morning. Hey, Good morning. We have a lot to talk about. We yeah. have a lot. Let's Big start stuff. with what, what will probably be the biggest film of the yes. summer. Yes. And I read somewhere that Tom Cruise in the new Mission Impossible performs the greatest stunt in 
in the in history. Cinematic history. It's so scary. The making of it? Yes. No. Oh, it's what does he do? Somebody watching. tell me. Sorry. I, we'll get to it. Okay, so it's Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, you guys. It's in theaters uh, July 12th, but it's hard to believe it's been 27 years, you guys, since the first Mission Impossible oh. hit theaters back in 1996. And this time, Ethan Hunt uh, and his team are racing around the world to track down a weapon that could destroy Ethan. all of humanity. And it's a villain I'm not really ever seen before uh, in these Mission Impossible films. I won't give it away, uh, but it's not a human being. I will say that. It's not a human being. Uh, but this movie, it packs all the action to your point Tom Cruise at 61 years old now but a couple of years ago 59 he filmed what's being called the biggest stunt in the history of cinema he base jumped off a cliff riding a motorcycle and then he free falls thousands of feet and y'all he did this on day one of yeah. filming oh my. which is crazy and he did it like so many Versus several parachute. times, Versus several parachute. times, no. it, it, it opens at, at a certain okay. point. But oh, that's you guys, when I was watching, I was on the edge of my seat mm -hmm. the entire really? time. The, the music, when the music comes on, I you know it's about wait. to go down. Okay. I cannot yes. wait. Yes, so good. I'm also so unreasonably <laughs> excited for the Barbie movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way, Dylan. This is the I movie. It's going to be the party of the summer. It's narrated by Helen Mirren, stars Margot Robbie as Barbie, <laughs> Ryan Gosling, Issa Rae, and also an appearance from Dua Lipa. But Barbie and Ken living out their best their best lives in Barbie land. And they get the chance of a lifetime to come live among the human beings. But adulting, you guys, as we know, it gets real, adulting real quick. Adulting overrated. Overrated. And Barbie has an existential crisis. And speaking of crisis, you guys, there was so much pink paint that was used in this movie. There was an international pink paint crisis no, last no. year because they used it all in the movie. That's oh, kind of crazy. That's so funny. And one more little fun fact. Uh, the real-life daughter of the Barbie inventor, Barbara Handler, 82, she makes a cameo in the movie. She's oh, like, that's oh, cool. I love and that. And she's who inspired the doll back oh, in the day. That's oh, that's great. Oh, I yes. can't wait for this It's one. a good one. Okay, so our next one, this is from our sister company, Universal. It explores the oh. story of the scientist behind. You were also mentioning this. I'm also really excited about this. It's going to be great. Yeah. Tell us about the Oppenheimer. Yes, it's directed by Oscar winner Christopher Nolan. It stars Cillian Murphy, Matt Damon, Florence Pugh, and Gary Ullman. And tells the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer, a scientist who developed the atomic bomb during World War II. And Christopher Ooh. Nolan, he went to great, you know, Know, lengths to make sure that this movie felt really big and epic. He recreated a nuclear explosion without the use of CGI. He's very anti-CGI. Wow. Also had a whole entire 1940s town created from scratch for this movie. Jeez. It's so great, and it comes out the same day as the Barbie movie, so folks are calling that weekend, oh July 21st, gosh. Barbenheimer. Ah, Barbenheimer. Get you a t-shirt. Yes, Barbenheimer. is so excited about this movie, That's yes. Fun. And you said this next one made you laugh and cry? Oh, it, it took me through all the emotional roller coasters you okay. could think of. It's called Joyride, and story of four friends who travel through Asia in search of their birth mothers. And the trip that they go on, it really goes sideways, completely off the rails. It kind of gives you the feels of The Hangover, but also mm -hmm. Girls Trip, such okay. a great Cast. You That's got Ashley Park. Combo. Yeah, Ashley Park from Beef, Stephanie Sue from Everything Everywhere All at Once, Sherry Cole and Sabrina Wu, and the chemistry between this cast is so incredible. They became real friends after this movie in real life. Um, but to your point, Craig, never laughed so much, never I've cried so hard in the same movie. I can't wow. wait. Chris all the emotions. You always Great bring it. Option. Thank, you, Thank, Chris. You. Thank, Thank you, Chris. you. We will be right back. Happy day after four. Third hour today, rapper Lil Jon is joining us on his next. What? Episode. Yes. Okay. Were you trying to imitate? Me? No, no, no. Yeah, it was. I think you was. No, it was not. Hold and Jenna, they're coming up next with the do's and don'ts of dating. Thanks for joining us, everybody.
about summer love and we'll show you how to plan the ultimate sexy date night without leaving your home. Then sweep your sweetheart away with a romantic getaway. We'll give you a tour of some hot destinations. Plus the do's and don'ts of dating and relationships with advice from matchmaker Devin Simone. So it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey guys, it is Wednesday, the 5th of July. I mean, I hope you had a great 4th. Slow down we summer, are. that's what we say. Slow, Slow down, down. down summer. Slow <laughs> it down. down. Slow oh. it down. Oh my gosh, don't you love the 4th of July though? Oh, I yes. love it. all of it. Me, um, me, me too. Okay. All right, we're doing a whole show, y'all. On summer loving. Mm -hmm. Remember that great, you've never seen Grease. I know the song. Summer loving had, had me a blast. blast. Okay, speaking of summer loving, there's a current dating trend for singles. It's, it's all over the summer. It's called inflay dating. Yeah, it's dating with inflation in mind. So it's a way to find a ways to have a lot of fun on a yeah. date without spending a lot of money. It makes basically. total sense. Which is actually some of the most memorable and fun dates there I are. think the simplest dates are the best. So it says this, according to a dating app, Plenty of Fish. <laughs> Never heard of it. 40, I mean, no, no offense, Plenty of Fish, but it, interesting. 48% yeah. uh -huh. um, of single millennials and Gen Zs have suggested going on a less expensive, budget-friendly date. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, there are a million ways to do it. I mean, if you, but you've got to get creative. Yes. I think. I mean, but but the, the simplest date, which is yeah. the best, yeah. is a walk. Oh, yeah. I mean, remember when I set up Libby with Cyan? Mm -hmm. I like to just... She's one of our bosses, and Jenna got them married. I yes. like to just talk about it. Mm -hmm. Y'all know, because I've talked about it on yeah. this program. Yeah. They went on... Their first date was a walk in Central Park. And it was a long walk, and it wasn't was a it? Long how many? Walk. How long? An hour? I think hours. Hours. I think it was hours. Yeah. That you also know quickly, because if you don't really have anything to talk about when you're on a walk, yes. then maybe you don't have much that you're clicking on. And there's no alcohol usually, so it kind of like, you're not leaning on something to make you feel comfortable. I mean, what if you got a call from someone who said, hey, you know what, let's go on a date, meet me in Central Park. Yeah. And you met him in Central Park and he had a picnic laid out. Ooh. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes. He had like a little, it didn't have to be fancy, but just like, hey, yeah. I thought this would be Sandwiches fun. Sandwiches or cheeses or And something. also you get to know somebody, if they don't like that, because they don't like bugs, they don't like whatever, yeah, totally. you, you already know. So a picnic's a good one. What else would a be good? A picnic is a great one. A day at the beach. A day at the beach is great. Hikes. You love a hike. I love You're always talking so about, much. Isn't hiking just walking along a trail? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> No, everyone's like, let's go on a hike. It's like, okay, I'll walk on that. <laughs> no, it's also Are you you're right. are you hiking up a mountain? Well, sometimes they're hills. Hills, okay. And you're hiking. <laughs> and I you're right. I don't really know the difference between a hike and a walk, except but for it, a walk can be like out on a street and a yeah, hike, hike is, is on a trail. On a trail. As okay. you said, <laughs> as you just mentioned. Okay. But hiking like that, you know that the person likes to be outdoors. Yeah, that's Henry nice. and I did a lot of national park yeah. stays yeah. before we you got did? married. And that's also a great What one. did you learn about him when, because well, he's an Eagle Scout. Yeah, so that he that. could like set everything up. Yes, yes. And yes. I could just sit back and chill. <laughs> but he would make, like, that it was fun. You know, I mean, we would get up at the crack of dawn, but he would, I mean, uh, thanks guys yeah. for having that prepared. Um, yeah. yeah. We, but also, you know, we, that it, I think he learned about me that I don't need fancy. I mean, we slept. That's important. Out By the way, that's very, very important. That tells you a lot about somebody. Yeah. You know, one of the things I remember from camping, I don't know why I'm remembering this right now, but I thought it was always so fascinating how you take a piece of aluminum foil and you put in, wait, wait, what? You put in a piece of chicken, raw, some veggies, wait, some veggies, salt and pepper, close it up and throw it on the fire, just like that. And then when you open it, after it's cooked for We were talking dating trends. No, but it is. Did you it's a do great that? Y'all would put no, a raw that. chicken <laughs> no, with, no. with vegetables? When did you do that? When I was in Girl Scouts. <laughs> no, but I was just thinking. And it, we, we used to watch it. And, they, and then the, the whoever the leader would say, okay, guys, time, time to get your thing. And you would take it. And it was so fascinating. You'd open it up. It was sizzling. The veggies were cooked. You put your own salt and pepper and stuff inside. And you had a little meal. Wow. Isn't that cute? We just <laughs> were like put hot dogs on the grill, but that, that sounds... But that was fun. That sounds good. All right. So. Okay. 
since we're talking love, yeah. <laughs> since we're talking love, yeah, yeah. we love a rom com. Love a rom com. You actually, nobody loves like a TNT rom com more than nobody. you. Nobody. <laughs> right? Nobody loves it more than me. By the way, it's my favorite escape. Do not put me you in front of You don't do it enough these days. I know. And to... I love a rom com. I know. Okay, so movieweb.com has a list of their best summer romance movies of all time. And here they are at okay. number three. How Stella got her groove back. back. Come on. That's a home best. run. Angela Bassett, Whoopi Goldberg, Tay Diggs. Yes. Remember Tay Diggs yes. before everyone knew him? I mean, that was a There's nothing better than sort of ten. like a revenge, a woman that like is getting back and then feels better than yes. she ever has. Yes, remember? I love it. Um, number two. Dirty Dancing. Classic. That's a classic. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, that one's I mean, that Dirty one Dancing. A, I mean, you can't beat that. No, you That really was can't. one of those. And then number one from 2008, Mamma Mia. Wow. That's a surprise contender, in my yeah. opinion. Wow. I love Mamma Mia. I do too. And, my, and actually, it's a great one to show your kids. Yes, and I love Meryl Streep. My Street kids too. love Mamma Mia, but I don't know that I would say that's the number Top one. Top rom com of, of, was it of summer. all time? No, oh, just of summer. summer. <laughs> okay. Okay, you want to know what mine is? What? Um, Oh, by the way, there's lots of rumors swirling, but no official confirmation that there will be another Mama there Mia. There will be. There has to be. That's so successful. So okay. wildly successful. I like how there's just a little audience of people clapping. I know. Um, I know. Okay. What's your favorite summer romance of all time? I love a lot of rom-coms in the summer. One of my favorite all time, no matter when it's on. Well, first of all, I love Sweet Home Alabama. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's one of the top rom-coms of all time. Time. In your mind. I love it. Yeah. Is that a summer rom com or a yeah, fall well, rom com? They're at the beach. Remember when the lightning strikes? I what do you mean fall? What does it mean? What season they shot it in? Yes. Okay, well, I don't remember what season <laughs> every rom com was well, in. For example, um, um, the holiday or um, what's the other one? No, the holidays. La wait, I like the last holiday. Okay, I That's too. the one. But the holiday or what's um, or the last holiday or what's the one? Um, oh God! This is what our show goes <laughs> south. Whenever, anyway, okay, look, those are win look, winter rom coms. I think both of us should always know. Those are winter know. rom coms. Okay. When Harry Met Sally is a fall rom com. Yes. We're talking okay. Summer rom -coms. I'm sorry, you have to remember the season <laughs> okay. each one was shot in. But here's the other thing. I think we should always pause for a minute if we ever say, "What was that thing?" <laughs> Let me think about it. That's when the show starts going south. I disagree. What, what, wait, 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 wait. Was that the thing? No, it wasn't I that. I disagree. I think people at home can relate. Okay, do you know what yours is? <laughs> <laughs> back to me. What is it? Hollywood Hager. Oh, back to me. <laughs> Don't, okay, my, on, my favorite, my favorite, my all-time favorite with Sweet Home Alabama Summer. Is, <laughs> yes. is my best friend's wedding. Come on! <laughs> See, it was a summer wedding, so it makes sense. I didn't remember. My so. favorite that I watched at a very inappropriate age, probably like second or third grade. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, we're talking about it. Cocktail. You watched Tom that? Cruise, how did you Elizabeth Shue. How did you sneak in and watch that? That I, was a great one. Oh my God, look at Tom Cruise. But if you saw, yet. do you remember? It? Yes. Right here, which, oh, geez. Oh, wow. Yes. There's but then, remember they go to the beach and it's summertime. Girl, you and your, okay. Okay. All right. It is now time for today's Summer Showdown. So all week long, y'all, we've been having fun debates on different summer-themed questions. Today's question, best place for a summer kiss. Mm. Think about it with us. Okay, here are some of the options that you can choose. On the beach. Mm -hmm. At a bonfire. Or in the ocean. Hmm. Um, of those three, I like, I think I like on the beach. With the sand everywhere? I think there's some, oh God, you know what? <laughs> No, I thought we were supposed to like play devil's advocate. No. Okay. Well, okay. I like on the beach because there's just it's one of my favorite places to be. Yeah. And I think when you're a place you love to be, and then something it amazing matter. like that happens. Yeah. yeah. I think the ocean seems good in theory, but I'm not sure if it's really good to you. <laughs> and I think the ocean could be could be. be could be nice. It depends how cold the ocean is. Yeah. And we're, wavy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, trying um, and, right. and salty. You know, uh -huh. getting sort of. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not uh -huh. sure if that's my favorite. Uh, but I kind of like a bonfire. A although bonfire I don't know nice. that I've ever kissed anybody, but at a bonfire. But, but it seems romantic. Yeah, like I feel like if I was a high school kid, yes. that kissed somebody. Yes. I, you know what else that's not on the list? What? A summer concert. By the way, that actually should be number one. 
Right? That really should. A, some, there's nothing like dancing with somebody. Yes, summer and you're concert. not sure, is the kiss coming? Is it coming? Yeah, is it? Maybe then, it will, and then it does. Right, it's a slow song. All right, coming up next, nothing says beach season like a stylish bikini. Okay, we've got a fun summer game inspired by some of our favorite celebrity swimsuit looks after this. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. It's like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage, liberated? We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Today is National Bikini Day, so we're going to celebrate. We're playing a new game, and it is called Who's in That Bikini? Who's in it? Okay. Does that mean like an any? And no. I know. Okay. I was thinking that too. Okay, so this is simple. I'm okay. going to show you a picture of a yes. celeb in rocking a bikini. You have to guess who that celeb is. I will give you three clues if you need them each, okay. and we'll alternate. Okay. If you get it wrong, the other person has a chance to steal. Okay. Are you ready? Ready! Perfect. Okay, Jenna, you're up first. Oh, good. Here's the first one. Oh, Halle Berry. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow! Yes! yes. That's, that's a very... That, that's I remember a very, that bikini. That was distinctive. Yeah. And she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. She's okay. in her 50s, isn't she? She's, she's gorgeous. Unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. All right. Hoda, mm -hmm. this one's for you. First clue. She starred in this TV series when she was just 18 Margot years old. Margot Robbie? No. Mm -mm. Second clue. Wait, she, she started while I wasn't listening. Sorry. <laughs> you know what? I don't like that one. Okay, Let's do the second clue. Don't doubt this missus. She's fire. What? I don't Mrs. Doubtfire? She's a real steel magnolia. Oh. Sally Field. Oh, good yeah. one, Janet. Yeah. Nice, nice. In Gidget. Oh, my God. From yeah. like the... Gidget. Gidget. Okay. Okay. Jenna. Sorry that I just stole no, that you from you. It's okay. You I felt like that was coming. Jenna, here's the, here's yours. Oh, oh yeah. Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, yes. Legally Blonde. I gave you the easy That's a common. Common. Fair, actually. Gidget? I mean, who's going to ring I honestly Gidget. didn't I even know. know. Remember Beach what? Blanket Bingo? Beach Blanket <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> Sally Field, I believe, was also in that. Go ahead. Okay, hold on. Here you go. Okay. First clue. <laughs> she teamed up with Missy Elliott for this music video. Second clue, she plays an instrument named Sasha oh. Flute. Oh, Third, so. it's about damn Lizzo, time, Lizzo. yes. In the tempo music video, which is such a good jam. I love Lizzo. Watch it for motivation. Love. Okay, Girl. Jenna, here you go. First clue, she played a princess in this movie. Second clue, she wore this bathing suit in a galaxy far, far away. Third, her classic hairstyle in the film resembled a cinnamon bun. Well, it's Princess uh, Le yeah. Lee, um, uh, Mary, Fi Mar Mary, no, Carrie, Carrie Fisher. Fisher. Yes, Carrie Fisher. <laughs> Mary Fisher. Carrie Fisher in Return of the Jedi. Wow, I don't remember hot, her too. in the bikini in that hot. Me either. Although I don't know if right. I've seen it. Okay, Hoda, here you go. Mm -hmm. First clue. Oh, I love this one. Oh my God, you she, did? Yeah, she wore this bathing suit while getting kissed in the rain. Second clue, she's not a mean girl, but sometimes oh, plays on the big screen. Oh, what's it, Silverstone? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's like two decades before. <laughs> I know, go ahead. Third, no. Nicholas Sparks Who wrote the book, no. but she's Rachel started. McAdam. Oh, Rachel oh, McAdam. From the notebook. From the notebook. That's my favorite rom-com. Or it's not really com. Okay, okay. Right. last one. First okay. one to Wait, get. do I have one? Yeah, you do. So <laughs> I'll try and get you no, two. No, it's, no, it's going to be whoever wins this wins it. No, what? what? You're like my kids. Like, what? you're like, no, you're winning, it? but if 
I get it's this, a... I win. Yeah. Okay, fine. Right. Okay. So we'll go up first one, one to guess. Okay. This one gets the point. Ready? And go. There's four oh. <laughs> And Jenna, you win this bikini. Oh my God. You win Borat's, but that's. Is this Borat's bikini? <laughs> wow. Thanks, guys. I'll <laughs> fit you and me. This is a weird game. Uh -huh. This was kind of a yeah. weird game. Yeah, real weird. Anyway, okay. but thanks for tuning in. Thanks. All right, up next, y'all, turn up the heat on your summer loving. Advice for your relationship dilemmas right after this. loving we wanted to help you with some common sticky situations so this is what's happening our staffers have agreed to act out for dating <laughs> predicaments in a segment we're calling Hoda, Hoda and, and Jenna's, Jenna's relationship, relationship dilemmas, dilemmas theater. theater okay and here to help us out is matchmaker and relationship expert Devin Simone okay we've never done this hello we have not ever. all right ready this I is am gonna ready. be totally weird so we have Ben and Dana well, two of our lovely staffers yes. are gonna act out a little something and they've been on three great dates and they're enjoying their fourth date on a lovely summer rooftop okay okay take it away this rooftop bar is so fun, and I can't believe it's already our fourth date. I know, and the cocktails are great. Wait, smile. Oh, you look so cute with um, your tiki cocktail. Okay. <laughs> Wait, are, are you putting that on Instagram? Yeah, on my story. Why? Uh, oh. Oh! <laughs> oh my god, the side eye. The oh, side okay. eyes. Devin, Devin. when yeah. is it too soon to post, and should you ask the other yeah, person. What's happened? What do you think? There's no <laughs> such thing as too soon, but you definitely want to communicate and ask. You want to get consent and make sure they're on the same page because some people might be just really turned off by it, like Ben clearly with that side eye, yeah. and some people just may not like living their life out in social media. So and you want to get consent. It also makes you Instagram official in a little way. It does way. not it make does you. Not. Do not assume. There are a lot of people oh, in imaginary relationships because they have posted a photo oh, and they No, but it. here's the thing, y'all. If you post a picture of your new person and I feel bad they have to pose like this, everybody assumes they're together. That, of course. Well, don't assume. Don't but we assume. do as a culture. Don't. Okay, let's right. go behind. Come this okay. way. Okay. Yep, to our next. Right, thank <laughs> Good you job, guys. Great job, guys. Guys. incredible actors. So Wonderful this, debut. This you. one, um, we have Sean and Allie. we have Allie. Sorry. And Allie's over there. Okay, go ahead okay. and tell us the scenario. Okay, so Sean and Allie went on a date about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Allie has not heard from Sean oh. since, and now it's a year later, and Sean has reached back out. Whoa. Go. Okay. <laughs> hey, you. How are you? <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> it's Sean. We went on a date last summer in the park. That's right, but I haven't heard from you since. Uh -huh. So my friends and I are meeting up later for some drinks. You want to come? Oh! Bread oh, crumbing. Bread 
crumbing. We don't uh, like it. Okay. That is actually zombieing. Oh, okay, zombie. so you've heard of ghosting, right? This is worse. This is zombieing. Uh -oh. And zombies are dead, so respect the dead <laughs> and leave him alone. Do not go on that date. That's wild. Don't yeah. go, Allie. Don't and go. also, if you're like Sean and you've decided to reach out after a year, what if you've decided... Oh, wait, I actually love this person. Well, then you love, need to... Well, just, I actually, I actually love <laughs> I, I actually could like this person. I and could want to like him. Or, or maybe you are in a tricky... In a better place. Yeah, you are in a weird situation. But then you need to explain that. You don't come in with the assumption of, hey, hey what's up, want to meet out with one of my friends. friends. He wrote and said, hey, I know we haven't talked Paul. in a year. Call. Call me. Don't Got text. Got Call. it. Okay, Don't Sean, you learn a little Allie, something. Excellent. By the way, Ali is, is married with three children. Don't, <laughs> don't want to go near her. Okay. <laughs> now we've got Sarah and Gavin. Uh, Devin, tell us about what's happening at this Also day. married. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so Sarah and Gavin have been dating for a while. They are on a date and go. Sweetheart, I've been meaning to ask you. Like, we've been dating all summer. Like, how do you think this is going? Oh, I, uh... I thought we were just having fun. Oh, it's so much fun, but this could really be a real relationship, right? Yeah, why don't we just see where it goes? Oh, oh no, this is not. See where it goes. See where it goes. See where it goes. <laughs> Gavin, how could you say that? That is so cool. Yeah, Gavin. Yeah, you know how <laughs> great flag it is. Anyway, okay, so what's happening here? What so should they be doing? where it's going, it's gone and went. That's not That's not a great scenario. You want to talk about it early on, what your relationship sort of objectives are. Just check in to make sure you're on the same page. Yeah. You don't want to invest in someone. Is that who's, weird? To, no, because you're not saying you have to be this, but you want to know. Imagine if you were a hitchhiker, not that I'm advocating. That. You're not going to get in the car with someone without first being like, I'm going north. Are you also going north? Yeah. Point. Then otherwise. And by the way, you've told us about previously about some dating apps yes. that kind of help place you Absolutely. With the like Tinder has a feature right now where you can actually say, I'm looking for a short term, I'm looking for a long term, I'm open for both. And a lot of their users report actually using that feature and having success with All it. Right. Well, right. Oh, we're sorry. Well, sorry, guys. Oh, but I'm glad you each have others. Let's yeah. go to <laughs> Emma and Eddie. Uh oh, what's going on? What's going on on this date? What's going on, Devin? Uh, Emma first and date, right? yes, Emma, Emma and Eddie are on a first date and go. I'm glad we finally got to meet. We've been talking online forever. Yeah, this was such a fun night. Yeah, I mean, you seem normal. Why are you single? <gasps> oh! Oh! Why are you, you single? Wait, you, you seem, seem normal? normal. Why are Ew. you single? Wait, did you say? Did, uh, sorry. <laughs> You seem normal. <laughs> okay. I mean, the bar has gotten so low on a compliment. Um, you don't, I understand why people want to ask, why are you single? But don't ask that. If you do, think about the delivery. So you could say something like, what do you enjoy about being single? What do you enjoy about being in a relationship? Okay, what do you feel like you haven't found so far that you're oh, looking for good. in a partner? That's good. That way you're going to get real helpful information can without I, putting them on the defense. Can I also just say to yeah. all the, the other people, People out there not dating, people would come up to my sister some and be like, why aren't you married? That is terrible. Don't ask, it. Don't ask not, that. Not men necessarily. Women, too, would say, well, so why haven't you gotten married? Which is the same thing as what's wrong Don't with you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think, but if you do get asked that, I like the new way of asking that. Because some yeah. people do want to know, no. wow, they're amazing. such an age. <laughs> Absolutely. But somehow did, some not, did something not work out? Because I've been asked that a million times just yeah. that. For forever, but yeah. you always think about like. And you can just say to, like, "This yeah, is what I, I haven't, you know, yeah. what I ha what I'm looking for that I haven't yet found." Or you know, showing that you're enjoying parts of being single and the things you're looking forward to with the right person in a relationship. It could open up a great conversation. Absolutely, Absolutely. Devin, you're the you best. And you know what? Amazing. Our staff Our are staff incredible actors rocks. and also staffers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coming up next, Alejandro Ramos has some simple ideas for a romantic date coming up right after this.
summer is officially the season of love. So to turn the heat on with your honey on a special date night, we've decided to come to some ideas. Well, you know who's got some really creative ones? Alejandro Ramos. She's today contributor and host of a great American recipe on PBS. Hi, Alejandro. Let's Hello. bring the romance in. Yes. Summertime. Let's get our romantic Absolutely. vibe on. We were saying earlier in the show, it's like the dates don't have to be expensive. There's simple exactly. ways to do lovely yeah. Honestly, I think simple is even better. Totally. So here's what I think is really fun to do. Play hooky with your honey. Oh, that's so, cute. Because I think we think of dates always like it's nighttime totally. things, but a day date is so fun. Oh, Plus cute. it gives you that sense of adventure, like yes. doing something okay. naughty together. So what do you do? So I love a picnic. Naughty. I know, a little, a little naughty, a okay. playful naughty. So we are, we're going on a picnic. I love, I love the idea of a picnic, so taking cute. advantage of these gorgeous summer days. Keep it simple. I love a tote bag yeah, style picnic agree. bag. It's insulated. Yeah, keeps the baskets, stuff. where are you, you going to keep them? You don't want a basket. You don't need a big no, cooler. And this, act, this set comes with all of these items. You've got the plates, the forks and oh, knives. You've got everything, yeah, even little be. cups. Mm -hmm. So then you just add some food to it. And I usually like to do like a big menu. You ladies know me. But for this, again, keep it simple. How adorable. How delicious, right? These are just some simple caprese sandwiches. You can do whatever you want. I like using baguettes for this because baguettes are heartier. So yes. they can hold all your fillings and yeah, they won't yeah, get yeah. soggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. And then pair them with some store-bought items. You don't need to make a whole thing. Totally. Grab some of your favorites from the grocery store, the jelly, yeah, whatever. Oh, keep it simple. What are you bringing along? A little game? All right. So here's a little game to have fun. Mm -mm. So this is, uh, it's called Where Do We Begin? And it's by Esther Perel. Okay. You know, oh, wow. the, the renowned oh, yeah. therapist. She's amazing, relationship okay. expert. And this is a great way to kind of get to know so your, what are some of the your love. So here, we've got a few we can, uh, okay. we can try here. So how about yeah. this? The most unexpected compliment I've ever received. Oh, geez. Just unexpected. Compliment. Compliment. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. I don't how about, know. How about this? Let's move on to this one. Pass, pass. When I'm sick, I want... My mom. Oh, oh don't we all so true? Sweet. Yes, we do. Don't you bring your mom when yes, you're not I feeling well? I don't know I how my that. husband feels. <laughs> <laughs> my mommy. Well, it's, yeah. it's like that's By the way, that's nurture. such a great, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And, it okay. can, and then that can lead to the conversation about what oh, would your mom cute. do for you when you're sick? And right. that kind of helps you share yeah. with that's your cool. partner. When I was young, I would spend hours daydreaming about Oh, I used to be, I wanted to be a cartoonist, so I would draw cartoons. I love that. I That's would right. draw. Them at I night. know which little yeah, man, you know which little one person. One. What about you? <laughs> uh, probably being a mom. Because you play That's with beautiful. Barbies. I love that. <laughs> well, that's what you did. It's well, the same thing. No, I played with Barbies. <laughs> okay. All right. So we, now we've moved to nighttime. We've nighttime. moved to nighttime. Oh, we're gonna wow. we're gonna Booted spice up. things up a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're gonna start off with a love potion. If you guys want to give that a little well, smell. So wait, this is what very is simple. It's just get a bottle of champagne or prosecco and this. It's from El Guapo. Wow. It smells like your perfume. It's, it's, or am I smelling it, your perfume? I think it's, it's me. A, no, no, it does. It has rose. It has lavender. It has florals. That's what I'm saying. It's a very simple way to add a a little bit of something fancy mm -hmm. to a simple uh, bubbly. So you just, just don't, mix it you up just a put a little in? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Plus those florals, they're, uh, you know, they're aphrodisiac. Okay. They make things kind of fun. All right. But Some it doesn't change berries. the color. doesn't change the color. It just, just adds a little extra flavor. Mm -hmm. nice. um, I love a bath. Are you guys mm -hmm. bath ladies? So no. this is a relaxing bath. She's like, no. no. Jenna <laughs> loves bath. She says she doesn't, doesn't like stewing in her own filth. Ooh, okay. All right. Talk well, about romance. Oh, well. Yeah, that's very, very sexy. You're right. I, I just don't like sitting in it. But I'm I got, sure others I got do. You. Well, some people do, and if and you do. Especially in other people's filth. Anyway, keep going. Sorry. Go ahead. Just, can we just We're really the spicing word, up Bill. the date night. <laughs> well, so this before, is keeping it real. A way to stay clean is, yeah. is um, so we can add these intimacy bath salts. These are from Foria. It's a wellness company. And these have cacao and CBD oh, in cacao. them. They help you relax. CBD. They help your body feel good. Get rid of the aches. Kind of get you relaxed. Mm -hmm. Because you want to be in that right mindset yeah. when you have a date night at home. Okay. So I love that. And they've got little um, uh, rose petals and things beautiful. in there. They're really, beautiful. really beautiful. 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 All right, so we had our day game. I'm now scared. we have a night game. Oh, this is Kinky Truth or Dare. Oh, oh I told you we were girl. spicing it up. Come on. <laughs> so we're gonna play it. So we we're not gonna we're no. not we're gonna play a modified version. <laughs> I hear people. All right, no. Here's I've got a good one. I think you guys will like this question. Okay. If you could travel back in time, what sex advice would you give yourself? Oh, jeez. Y'all. No, no, that is not. No, no, no. This <laughs> feels inappropriate. No, think about something like, how about asking for what you want, choosing a good partner, things like that. But again, it's meant to be playful. You're supposed to have fun with your partner. So these are fun. And then, <laughs> and then the red side are the dares. We'll leave those, we'll leave those for date night. Let's oh, just wow. pick up a dare and no, see. No, let's let's. 
you are a Wait, rock what? star and I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> I'll do anything you ask me to do anything. <laughs> Yo. Role play. It's a role play. It's a role play. So right. uncomfortable. Okay, let's now let's get to, to the food. food. All right, all right. <laughs> let's drown well, our you feelings. Guys, you, guys, you guys like food. <laughs> we like cheese a lot. All right, so here are some fun kind of things that you can share. I love desserts and things that you can dip and use yeah. your hands yeah, with. Yeah. So here we've got some strawberries with some creme fraiche and some brown sugar, and so you can kind of dip it in the creme uh, fraiche. Creme you brush. can enjoy it on your own. <laughs> you can share. Oh. We've got some really nice cheeses. Love this it. is a cocoa rub cheese, some okay. nice soft it cheeses. It beautiful. So it's just food that you can yeah. kind of share and play around with Love and it. enjoy yeah. Love it. with Love your partner. It. Love and if you it. don't right. finish the cheese tonight, you can take it on the picnic tomorrow. See? There you go. There you go. There All you right. go. <laughs> from a date night at home to a romantic rendezvous away from it all. Okay, we're going to show you some fabulous getaways for two right after this. a romantic vacation that could spark a little summer loving, whether you're spending time together in the great outdoors or if you happen to be going to a resort yes. somewhere. And travel expert Davey Sutton is here to tell us about some A-lister hot spots without the hefty price tag. Uh, hi. 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 How are you? I like the great outdoors is a good place to start for couples. Yes, I'm going to take you to Banff, which is in the Canadian Rockies oh, wow. in Alberta, Canada. And how beautiful. Also, one of the stops for Prince William and Kate and their post-wedding royal tour. But you don't need a royal budget to enjoy this place because if you ask any outdoor adventurer, they're going to tell you that this is on their wish list and you can pair up and go in, in, the, in the winter. Oh God, scary. Yes, you can go hiking, you can go biking, oh you can go uh, um, to Lake Louise, hiking. which has beautiful romantic places, but you don't need a royal budget to enjoy it. You can stay at the Mount Royal Hotel, which is right in the town center of Banff. So it's, you just walk out your hotel, you can walk to the shops and restaurants, and it can uh, summer rates just start at 194 a night. Oh, it looks like Vail. It's got that vibe. Those yes, the yes, so mountain vibe. Really yes. magnificent. Okay, what that is for the, the adventurers, but let's relax a little. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to take you to Scottsdale, Arizona, which is world renowned for their, their resorts and their spas. But you know what? That was also the place where Jay Z and Beyonce what? had their honeymoon what? in Scottsdale, reportedly. And you know what? No. Yes, you can have create your recreate your own crazy in love ad adventure because it's. <sighs> but you know, first I want to say I'm telling you to go to Scottsdale in the, in the summer. summer. In the summer. It doesn't seem like a great idea, but why is it a <laughs> good idea? Because it's the low season, it's the off wow. season, so you can get the discounts on those luxurious spas and mm -hmm. resort treatments. And you know what? You can do your couples massages, and I'm going to send you to the Westin Kierlin Resort and Spa, and they have a uh, award-winning golf course. They have an adults-only pool, so you and your cool. boo can have that, you know, special moment yeah, looking like at the that. desert. And rates start at just 179 a night in the summer. What nice. if you like a city vibe? What if you're a city person? We're going to go to Miami, oh, yeah. yes, because that's like the second Hollywood, right? You right. can always see the celebrities there, but more so, it has the, the, it has the nightlife. It has the <laughs> 
beach and you're feeling like hot and spicy when you're in Miami, I'm going to send you to the Arlo Windwood. It's a new hotel oh. and it has the light, airy vibes that, that put you right in the center of, of Miami. It has a rooftop hotel and summer rates. Just start at 137 a night. Wow. So you can have your own hot and spicy Miami nights there. How fun is wow. that? Yeah. Okay, the next one is a getaway that has people feeling like a celebrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because in the summer we always see celebrities on their super yachts yeah, or, yeah, yeah. you know, on their, on taking sailing trips. So Maine Windjammer, they are a historical sailing ship. Oh, wow. And they will take you to the coast of Maine and you can go on these coves. It's a small ship, has 20 rooms. It's pared Wait, down. You sleep in it? You can sleep in it. You unplug. It could be really romantic Beautiful. because you're going in and out. The, I talked to the captain. He said he has never been to taken the same trip twice because you go with the wind and you go with the okay, weather awesome. and you think that's intangible, right? Yeah, because yeah. celebrities do it. So you can expensive. take a trip starting at 250 a night per person. They do uh, two, three day cruises, six day cruises. And when you go, are you with other people or you're by yeah. yourself? No, well, you would want to take your partner, right? Yeah, but I mean, there's, there's it's, a it's, max 20 people so, aboard. Yeah, so it's yeah. small, cool. you eat there, it's, everything is fresh and lovely. Oh, take amazing. us to overseas. Just give us a big international trip to wrap it up. Okay, we're going to go to Panama City. So Panama, or Panama, right? Yeah, and yeah Panama City, Panama. Panama, yeah. right, where the Panama Canal is. Yes. And you know what? This is a kind of like a secret spot for celebrities because yeah. a lot of movies are shot down there. And then they stay. But this hotel that I'm going to tell you about, Hotel La Compania, this is a hotel. In Casco Viejo, is that the town, the little part of the yes. old city? <laughs> yes, and it's so beautiful, and it's a historical place. It has an infinity pool, delicious food, and this is a, I asked the hotel to tell me what celebrities stay there. Yeah. They will not disclose it, but you can that. stay there just like a celebrity. Thank oh my gosh, you. Davey, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Coming up next, Donna's spreading the love on the streets of New York City. She's got some fun trivia and surprises after this. Weather starts to sizzle, so does the summer loving scene here in New York City. So Donna took it to the streets to get the dish on dating and romance. Yeah. Hey, you know I love romance. Yes. The Big Apple is buzzing this time of year, so I hit the town with some fun trivia to get the lowdown on love. And you know I had a few surprises up my sleeve, of course. It's summertime in New York City, and every time I come to Central Park, I I think I'm in my very own rom-com. So today, I'm gonna interview some people about their love stories. And you know I've got some surprises in hand. So tell me, how did you two first meet? It's a classic modern love tale. We both swiped right on an app. <laughs> what did you think about each other at first glance? Very tall. <laughs> very short. <laughs> I went to college with his sister and we were good friends and she I was like, you should talk to my brother, so... Yeah. And it, it worked? It worked. <laughs> yeah, it was her first day of opening. It's how uh, we work at a water park. Okay. I saw her come up, and I just knew how to talk to her. <laughs> and did you know it was love? We were just walking through Times Square, and uh, someone just hollered out to me, being like, you've got a big smile on your face, you should marry her. And years later, I did. What is your favorite thing about each other? He's so kind and responsible and 
cute. I love her persistence. You know, I'm a little bit of a shyer, more uh, introverted dude. You two were on your first date? We're on a first date Did we right just now. crash your first date? The Today Show crashed our first date. <laughs> it's true. Is that awkward? A little bit, but kind of, it's fun. It's a good story. So uh, what was your first impression of each other uh, about an hour ago? Oh, wow. Well, I met him, I saw him, and I thought, oh, such a cute guy. <laughs> love to play a game with you. Would you rather play a game of summer lovin' about each other or a game of summer lovin' about Central Park and romantic movie trivia? Each, each other, other. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I love let's it. See, Where did you go on your first date? Ready? Reveal. You got it right! <laughs> you won a $100 gift card for lunch, dinner, or drinks at Parker's Thompson Central Park. Thank you. Amazing. What's your anniversary? February 15th. The 15. day after Valentine's Day. You won two tickets to Hall de Lumiere, which puts <laughs> you in the center of artist Gustave Klimt's most iconic work. Yes. Congratulations and have fun. What is your best piece of love advice? Show us. Oh my gosh, and he matched. You guys are a match made in heaven. <laughs> You're going to new heights. You won two tickets to Summit One Vanderbilt, New York's newest observatory. Thank you Yay! so much. Let's do the trivia. Central Park is a classic setting to so many marriage proposals each year. Which of the following is not a location in the park that someone can get engaged at? A, Sheep's Meadow, B, The Great Lawn, or C, Wrigley Field? Wrigley Field. Yeah, you knew it. <laughs> you get a $100 gift certificate to Burger Joint. It's located at Thompson Central Park. It's the best kept New York secret. What do you think about that? I love more. It. I love it. It. <laughs> the hit rom-com Serendipity took place in Central Park. Who played the leading roles in the movie? A, John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale, B, Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams, or C, Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson? Um, I think it's A. A. Yes, you knew it immediately. Yeah. You win a $300 gift card to Serendipity 3, one oh. of New York's most legendary restaurants, and you can have your own Serendipity moment. Oh, awesome. that's pretty awesome. Central Park is a popular wedding location in New York City, but which city in the United States is the most popular wedding destination? A, Orlando, Florida, B, Santa Barbara, California, or C, Las Vegas, Nevada. It's gotta be Las Vegas, Nevada. I'd also go for Las, Las Vegas, Vegas. Of the numbers. Yeah. Guess what you won? And the Today Show wants to send you on a second date. Oh. You won an Eventbrite gift card for 7th Street Comedy and Burgers, so you'll get to go to a comedy speakeasy and hopefully your relationship will right. come out of this. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you awesome. so much. Thank you. I love it. I love New York this time of totally. year. You never know who you're going to run into. Everybody who plays. You're gonna meet. Everyone <laughs> plays. It. It's so fun. Right. I love it. Cool. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Donna. And we'll be back right after this. And that's going to do it for our summer loving show. Tomorrow we've got summer skincare solution and entertainment galore with our summer watch list. Plus, we're celebrating National Fried Chicken Day. What? See y'all tomorrow. Bye. Bye.
When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see oh, you again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney Dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift 
caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kuros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili, mustard, onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Ready! There, are. nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, v vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of conies. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a la and That's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop, like when you bite into it and oh, snap, it's like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bond, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's the, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, it'd be mm -hmm. cheaper the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. Little All more. right, that's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the chili to go in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it. Yeah. I want that You're chili. Chintz out on Get that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right? Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There. Yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there, and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries, just as the auto industry do. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, the family, family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. 
it's really nice being run by a family owned business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating ponies, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Pony dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit, and that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan 
for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tastes so similar to the wood as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? For this chili? is Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay.
I scream, you scream. I, okay, I'm going to stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington candy shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I got to tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn of the century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002. But they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899 and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs, but a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think 
Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker. And he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. We're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, it means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women, to have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise.
finish this sentence. Ice cream is love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How it's nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in D.C. for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this, you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and our, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where a, upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes. Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference and they were like, hey, she's opening an Abbey Ice Cream shop. This is crazy. And you're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto? The sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also, you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's or talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. 
I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with little league kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? Like, like, like. It's time for Sunday School. Say amen, say hallelujah. <laughs> amen! Hallelujah! <laughs> my Sunday School teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should learn to scoop with your uh, own... My own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow. All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mix-ins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to use a small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like, for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or it'll jam something, you know, things like that. And now, back to Sunday school. So what's my flavor? So your flavor, so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that, you, uh, that you're, a fan, you're a fan of cookies and cream. I am. Also, you like sweet potato pie. So I do. Okay, so this is a combination. And pecans. Of, well, right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie. But, but yeah. yes. I can tell you guys are married. <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust or pecan, Ooh. Uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blend it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here 
is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta -da. Right? So, the cup, now we'll get a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, no, oh, look, now good. you're gonna form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're, mm -hmm. now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually. Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, your neck of the woods. Oh, I like Get it. it. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who is the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. You're smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults funny they would share <laughs> in las vegas a few miles off the strip is the flashy fabulous and insta famous ice cream shop creamberry opened in 2016 by husband and wife team danny and rosalina c hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe we set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy innovative desserts into one place for danny it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruits on top for the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino halo halo. Recognizing the power of social media, 
Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long and behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not gonna come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. Luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, Just maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. 
the creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food at those days. <laughs> those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food. You know, and they were like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012. And his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for? Curry chicken and rice. And he invited me over, and once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are, we try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing. Don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something, he had a vision. I said, OK, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, were, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next oh, morning. Uh -huh. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make $50 something dollars. And the next day I make $80 something dollars. And I said, OK, I'm seeing an increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival, his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim, what, what to you, what was the game changer? What, what put this place over the top? Wow. His presence and his dedication. Jerk chicken and hot sauce. Now, loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, Food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh about yeah, that? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different, and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant 
industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this, you know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell, like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know. One day it might be just me and you. You got to show right. me how to cut this meat. chicken and oxtail. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail. My mom is Southern. And she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail. And she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not ask them. <laughs> God, the, the price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the shop, Mr. Oh, Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey. <laughs> This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper, mm. also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call Yava Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh, yeah. They say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burn sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last, give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up, make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. Normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now, oh yeah, you see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it, and it doesn't cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This, what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. 
Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. How is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> it's the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. Whoa. OK, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I have my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed. These are beef patty. I got to try that. Oh. That's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pats? Uh -huh. This pat right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pat to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did. What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is it's, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything's going to be all right. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekon Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not gonna even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang. A refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon, Anne working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. 
she took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand. Working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's just retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam, and turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Anne's husband fled the city first, Will leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later, uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. We came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Ann still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. I asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's way too much work. Eventually, Ann agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. I She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu? His mom's pho. So pho you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we would cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at, at least three days. Um, we have it pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes um, and that is because of the, you know, the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, just cubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. 
It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi. Thầy thấy nó nó tự xúc động rồi mình lấy thôi chứ mẹ đâu có biết làm sao giờ. Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được từ ngày nào thì hãy lấy vậy thôi. Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yune Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here, we give them the food, they said, where's the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands, you can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere at Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was the uh, one who hooked me up. To this. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. 
I feel like we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open restaurant and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesh's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo, or the steak tartare. When it's uh, done right, that's probably the best dish in the world. There's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I, I think we're going to fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only 3 or 4% of our business. And overnight, we had to do 100% of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food does not take out. So we had to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it, boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around, so I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture, learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business, and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other. To comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do. He covered the same thing. He cannot cook, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chef, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere.
But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damian Vasquez. Damian, nice welcome to see to the you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. That's so, gonna be a gonna, lot of fun. You guys gonna give me a tour? Absolutely. Yes, All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, <laughs> okay. And it's still producing fruit? It's still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolf had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Hass turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. 
It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S., so it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. Got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading bloc. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. And this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty different, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to catch. Ta-da! There you go, My that's first a nice avocado. one too. It's gonna take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hass. 
it just keeps it well, really fresh. You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce. It's avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien. And this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like he said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're going to be here after us. So we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elise's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant and my mother was in the kitchen. 
thought she was the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Poldo was well, washing yeah. dishes. <laughs> Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. These have come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an Avila? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salute, mija. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me about Mama Avila's soup. That soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is, Nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt Just on top. Just a little, top. Just bit, a of little salt. bit of love. And then you're gonna use the top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocajete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And I gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh, yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. I've learned from the best. 
Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great, great grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. The ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar. It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family-owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in the coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave a small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. En, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly, I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. 
Con el paso de los años finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbosch come from? So Holbosch is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wild locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocteles, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So aguachile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect. That's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this now. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, right? Mm -hmm. So, you see that? Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh, yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? I <laughs> think that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. That is our scallop agua chile. And I helped make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? That looks like a good bite. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Hass avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. When most of us think about Detroit, 
Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So, what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see oh, you again. Good to see it's been you. a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney Dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. 
Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from National to Kirby's to Nikki D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili is a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You think yes. about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili, mustard, onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential Coney. One up! Ready! There, are. nice shot. Yeah.
At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, v vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of conies. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Got, uh, pork, beef, and, a, and That's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop, like when you bite into it and oh, it's snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bond, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's the, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. Just so open it up a little, grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheaper the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, Al. Little All more. right, that's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the chili to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that You're chili. Chintz out on that yeah, chili. Really, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right? Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There. Yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. 
What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there, and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries, just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid 80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, the family, family employees, that's for John. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. 
it's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, and we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits, and we learn from each other, and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating ponies, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Pony dogs, though, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, with my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all-vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were going to open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan 
for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to the wood as a, a regular Pony Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay.
I scream, you scream. I, okay, I'm going to stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington candy shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda